Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are speaking with Gavin Erringer. Gavin has been writing about companion animals throughout his 25-year writing career. He is at work on his latest book, Coming to the Fire, The Unnatural History of Dogs, Cats, Cows, and Horses. The book's premise is that these animals gave up their wild freedom in exchange for our care and protection. The book is an exploration of what they got and gave up in return. One of the key discussion points is that the fate of domestic animals is influenced by decisions we make before they are ever born. And for this reason, animal breeding is at the heart of coming to the fire. Gavin, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Good morning. Nice to be on the show, Stacey. This is a fascinating topic, and I know you are currently in the middle of writing this book, but you've written about animals for 25 years. How did you get interested in writing about animals? Well, it's kind of a a long story, so I'll make it short. Um, When I was a kid, I grew up next to a game farm, and I, I just had this sort of magical attraction to animals and vice versa. I used to sit down in a field and the deer that were kept there would actually come up to me. And I remember one time sitting in the field and they actually came up to me and touched me with their noses, which just fascinated me. And I I'd sort of always had that with animals. And I've always had a great deal of compassion for animals. At one point, I actually became a working cowboy on a ranch in Colorado. That's how I put myself through college. And we were involved with horses and cattle. And of course, I, I got a dog and he turned out to be a great herding dog. And we also had cats in our barn that sort of lived the barn cat life. So all of them were sort of fascinating to me. And I thought about it uh, over time. And this became sort of the culmination of my life's work to put them all together in one book. It sounds really fascinating and, and interesting. Have you ever worked in a shelter environment or have you pretty much worked mainly with farm animals? Oh, no, absolutely. One of my jobs is uh, I my side work is as a dog trainer. I, I became really fascinated with my herding dogs, so I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to get into that. I thought I was a good trainer, but he was just really, really smart. But <laughs> I've learned, that's a true story. So I, I've learned to uh, herd with my dog, and so that led to work as a trainer, more of a generalist trainer and dog sport trainer, and then work with shelters. And uh, when I was living in Whidbey Island, Washington, I, I worked with the uh, with the Animal uh, Foundation there on the island and, and did some volunteer work with them and worked on their board a little bit. Let's really dive deep into coming to the fire. We had a little bit of a conversation before taping the show, and I can tell we could probably talk for hours on this subject. <laughs> but let me find out from you, what was the spark that you got to start creating this book? And tell us a little bit more detail about what your thoughts are with regards to sort of the unnatural history of dogs, cats, cows, and horses? Well, I was in Mexico uh, kind of evaluating my writing career and figuring out what direction to go in next. And I was reading a book by Michael Pollan, and it was called The Botany of Desire. And uh, the idea of that book was that uh, that these plants had sort of manipulated our human desires uh, for their own advancement. And I got to thinking, you know, Domestic animals did the same thing. They kind of came to our campfire is the metaphor I use, but they uh, came to us and uh, we derive uh, innumerable benefits from them in exchange for uh, caring for them and protecting them and feeding them. And so the idea of the book really was, uh, what are they getting in return? Are we living up to our end of the bargain? So that's really what the book is about. It's, It's a question of are we doing the right things by them? And you chose to use mainly these, you know, companion animals less than like animals that we would see on at zoos or circuses or or something like that. You chose dogs, cats, cows, and horses. Was there a specific reason just to help you with focusing, or that's like a whole nother conversation? Those other animals in those situations. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these, again, were the animals that were familiar to me. These were the ones I'd worked with day in and day out for years and written about, horses particularly, but also dogs. 
and cows to a lesser extent. The cats are a sort of a new experience, and I'm actually having to query a lot of my friends and learn a lot of things about cats. But uh, the reason I took domestic animals is because um, somebody made this analogy that made a lot of sense to me. If you think about the world, it's not so much a big wilderness with cities and highways interspersed. It's more like a big farm. Humans mm-hmm. have had a, a huge impact on the globe. And so it's it's like a farm with a farmhouse near here and there called Chicago or Denver or L.A. <laughs> you know, if you get in a car and drive, what you mostly see is farmland or land that's dedicated to animal agriculture. So humans have profoundly changed the world, and we brought these animals along with us, and they've benefited hugely, you know, as far as biological survival goes. I wanted to look kind of at the micro picture and the macro picture of these animals' lives. Right, right. And so you talk about these decisions that we make, and I'll sort of bring it around to the conversation of cats with the knowledge mm-hmm. that you're actually in the middle of writing the cat section. So right, maybe right. even today's show, I can influence you in certain directions uh-huh. in the, the content of the book. But, you know, we were talking about cats used in cat shows and then going through to our regular domestic cats. And we're making these choices of whether our house cat is an indoor only cat, indoor outdoor cat. We mm-hmm. have community cats. We make these choices to return these cats back to the community or to rescue them. There's all these decisions and all these choices. Mm-hmm. We have mm-hmm. we have working cats, working barn cats. We're mm-hmm. talking about that our feral cats in the community may not be thought to be first-class citizens, but more like third-class citizens. And I'm trying to think of ways that these perceptions or what can we do to make these perceptions change. And I had on about a month ago, I had on a woman who wrote a book about the shop cats of New York, which really made working shop cats in New York City. So, yes, we're talking about New York City here, but making Mm -hmm. them very almost high end, appear very high end and having Mm -hmm. these wonderful Mm -hmm. lives and well loved. But yet they are still considered community cats. And what's really sad, though, is as those cats in those shops pass away, many of the stores are not choosing to replace those cats in those uh-huh. businesses because the reason they took those cats in in the first place was because of a need, a reactive need. You know, the cat's sitting outside, it's wanting food. It wasn't an intentional decision to go to a shelter and adopt a cat for the store. It was more of the cat found them, not them finding the cat. Do you feel that in our world, we need to continue to sort of allow for those types of community cats or you know, is our objective to sort of reduce our community cat numbers in such a way and then bring it into the potential of talking about sort of almost intentional breeding? I mean, we are almost at that point where some areas of the country, they're kind of short on cats. Yeah, let me kind of unpack that because there was a lot of things you said there. So I want to start with the idea of cats as having a different sort of structure, class structure. Um, So let's start at the micro picture at the top. I went to this wonderful cat show in Denver, and uh, I I showed dogs, so I thought, you know, I understood that picture a little bit. And one of the cats was one of those weird naked cats. Have you seen those, the ones like in the Austin Powers movie? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I went to meet the naked cat people, and one of the women was especially fascinated. She had tattoos of her naked cats that had passed away on both of her forearms. And she was, a, you know, the quintessential kind of crazy cat lady. But she was really, really nice and interesting. She wasn't, you know, un- unusual. She just loved these cats. But she explained to me how they came to be in the 1960s. There was this mut- mutation in, in cats, apparently some cats. And they started trying to breed them so that they were hairless. So basically they had some success and then they had a lot of problems. And then there was another cat with one of the same genetic mutation, and then they were able to use that one as the breeding foundation for the breed. So basically every naked cat emanates from one or two pair, you know, a pair of cats. And that raises the question of, you know, is that really a good thing for genetic health? Because if any sort of defects exist in that in that cat line. Uh, we're just carrying those forward. Now, I don't know that there are any, but it's one example of how we we sort of tend to take things to the extent without considering what the future outcomes will be. Do you follow me? Yeah, 
De- oh, definitely. Yeah, we have. And then, I mean, there are many, many times we make decisions and we we don't really think through the consequences. Right. Exactly. I mean, our goal there was to have a naked cat. How cool! You know, it's sort of like I like to think of animals. One one person said this: animals are like brands, and people want to have exclusive brands. You know, they're proud that they drive a BMW or that they have a Mercedes. And they're proud that they are an English bulldog person or that they have naked cats. People like variety, but that's not always in the best interest of the animals to sort of take that too far. Now, the other thing you were talking about is uh, community cats. And, you know, I think this is the thing, Stacy. I think that we've always had what I call a working class of animal. These are animals that lived on the farm or lived in the city and had a job to do. We recently saw an outbreak of a, a particularly a rare disease in the Bronx uh, that's carried by rats. And uh, one of the problems is that they simply don't have sufficient numbers of, of cats around in people's homes and things to keep the rats at bay. And that's an example of how, you know, a cat is a working animal. It, we may not train them like we do dogs, but they do serve a purpose, and they always traditionally have. But what we have now is something that's fairly new, the pet cat. And the pet cat is something that really probably barely existed throughout life. I, I think that we always thought of animals in utilitarian terms, and now that we are all fairly well-to-do in the developed countries, we... we have a different relationship with with our pets and our and our animals that is new so those are kind of my idea of different classes of animals we've got the working animals the feral animals as well uh, which are different Uh, and then we also have sort of a middle class pet animal and then at the high end we have these these show animals or these breeding animals that are that are extremely valuable and each one has its own sort of considerations as far as the pluses and minuses of them Right. No, that all makes sense. And as you were saying about the developing of the the pet cat, I mean, we didn't have cat litter until the 1950s. (laughs) So that, you know, which to some people seems like a wicked long time ago. For me, it wasn't that long ago, but for others, it was a long time ago. So, so that's 66 years. So, you know, my, my parents' generation, they didn't have access to cat litter. So you didn't have a litter box to worry about in the house, which in my idea, might be kind of an exciting thing every now and again. But but then again, then we always had our cats going outside at that point in time, too. Right. So, you right. know, as we, as we bring cats in, and there are also forces out there that would like to see more cats as indoor only because of, you know, predation issues and killing of wildlife and that kind of stuff. So, you know, as the rats take over and the cats dimish, diminish, you know, then also – there are some theories that would say that our bird population would increase, which, you know, is not necessarily the case because there's certainly a lot of other scenarios out there that can harm birds just as easily as a cat can. And with the rats, too, you know, anytime you dig up a plot of land to build a new high-rise building, you're going to be unearthing a whole slew sure. of rats. Sure. Um, and so, you know, I've been working in with a group in Chelsea, Massachusetts, and they've been doing a ton of construction in the city. So, so much right. conversation is around rats because right. they've just been dig- – it's a small area, small footprint, but they've been digging up everything. And so they're just destroying all the habitats of the rats. And so it's becoming more of the cats are figuring out how to cohabitate with the rats rather than really killing them. And uh, so we're sort of seeing that happening in urban areas too. I right. find this interest this incredibly interesting mm. um, because I think that – As our shelter numbers go down, which is what everybody is the objective, you know, with with reaching no kill by 2020, we have this objective to, you know, have our intake rates get as low as possible. How do we provide those companion animals, you know, to sort of the marketplace that we've kind of trained to adopt cats and dogs? So now we've created this market, but yet we're not going to be able to supply the market if our numbers go down. And then you're saying the word breeding. Well, I think there's always, you know, if there's a shortage, there will be a market response. And people will probably go to providing animals by breeding, you know. Um, and cat breeding is interesting. It's so different than dog breeding because always, you know, with uh, with dogs, 
<clears throat> we've bred purposefully, at least going back to the time of the Egyptians when they started creating actual breeds as opposed to just a generic uber dog. But I think, you know, cats, we've pretty, that's the one different thing about cats in my book is this is an animal that we left largely to breed on its own, to make its own breeding decisions. It used to be when I was a kid that basically someone would have a litter of kittens and then put them in a box and sell them, you know, for $5 or $10 or give them away. Right. And now we face the scenario of, um, as you say, you know, if we were successful in reducing our shelter populations to a, a, a very much lower point, there will still be that demand. And then it will become a for money proposition to breed cats. And, and that's what kind of concerns me is that when money enters into the game, uh, oftentimes rational or good decisions uh, go out the door. Now, there will be ethical people who will breed for longevity and health and, and many other things. Uh, but there's always people who cut corners and, and maybe breed for the wrong reasons or breed for the wrong outcomes. Um, and what particularly worries me is like the outcrosses with wild cats. We're, we're, we're going into kind of an mm. experimental zone with that <laughs> where mm -hmm. people want really exotic pets and they're worth lots and lots of money. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if that's really a good solution, but it's something that we've done with dogs for a long, long time. Are you starting to think about that special gift? Why not give the gift of a Community Cats podcast branded t-shirt, coffee mug, bag, or other item? This is the perfect way to spread the word about helping Community Cats. The proceeds from the sales will go to support the Community Cats podcast and the Community Cats Grants program, which helps small groups grow their fundraising programs to be able to fund more spay-neuter programs for free-roaming cats. Go to www.communitycatspodcast.com and click on our shop button in the menu bar today to get that perfect community cat gift right now. Thank you, everybody, for supporting the show. Want to learn more about grants? Register for Grants 101, a Community Cats podcast webinar on March 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Learn the ins and outs of writing grants, how to track them, and how to do follow-up reports. This is a perfect educational opportunity for a small organization looking to develop a strategic grant writing program as a fundraiser. Go to communitycatspodcast.com and click the link on the homepage to register. After registering, you'll receive a confirmation email containing information about joining the webinar. That's Grants 101, a Community Cats podcast webinar on March 30th at 2 p.m. Looking back at dogs and as horses, as previous breeding examples, are there lessons mm -hmm. that we should be learning from, I hate to say it, but from those industries as we look down 10, 20 years in the cat world? Or it's well, happening I, now, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the use of the word industry is very apt. It's it, their industry. And we honestly need to think about the, the, the commercial aspect of animals carefully, of course, they're industries. You know, of course, people aren't doing these to lose money, or some are. I mean, of course, there's always hobby people, but there's a lot of people breeding for money, and there's no problem. I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with is what are the values behind that? You know, what are the ethical considerations? Are, are you an ethical individual? Are you doing this for the sake of the animals as well as the people? I mean, are you balancing this equation? Because it is a, it's a trade-off. You know, it's like like the book says, they came to the fire in exchange for our care and protection. So we owe them our protection and our care. And we can fall short of that, especially when the money gets large and people start doing things more for their ego or, or are out of greed. Right. Um, and would you like me to you give it, I can give an example of that. Um, yeah, sure. In, in that would be great. In the, horse, in the horse industry, there was this amazing horse. His name was Impressive. But what, a, what an apt name. He was this uh, sort of Aristotelian idea of the, of the perfect horse. He was muscular. He was beautiful. He went into the show ring, and he had this huge presence. But it turned out that his musculature was the result of a mutation that caused his muscles to be in agitation all the time. So there was sort of a, a problem with the, the cell structure that was causing them to always, the muscles to be firing and passed that on to his offspring. And it took them many years to admit that this problem existed. It was fairly easy for them to trace back to the individual because he was in every pedigree of every baby that had this problem. Um, and it was lethal. 
I mean, that's the problem. It, it was a lethal problem for many of these young horses. What ended up happening is uh, the, the very, very wealthy people who were involved with these horses didn't want to admit that they had a problem. And they could have stopped that problem in its tracks merely by saying, uh, you can't breed to this, you know, you can't have this horse in your bloodline, we're not, we're not going to register them anymore. But instead, they, you know, they created genetic tests and did all this focus focus stuff. And now you can keep registering them as long as they're negative for this trait. But people still want these animals for that beauty and everything. Well, that's not in the best interest of the animal or the breed. You know, it's, it's mm. just not a good thing. Um, and yet, you know, greed and money kind of motivated people to find a workaround. And uh, science can provide a lot of animal uh, answers. And I'm very optimistic in regard to genetic diseases associated with dog breeds that they things like uh, genetic engineering might allow us to correct some of these these genetic flaws. But it's not as simple as snipping out one gene and putting in another. These things are multi multi dimensional with genes affecting a lot of different things. That means that, you know, we may not be able to solve a lot of these problems. There isn't always a silver arrow that's going to fix all these problems that we're creating with our animals. So we have to be very careful about being conscientious and ethical in our breeding decisions. And that means being informed. That means knowing an awful lot about these animals and their backgrounds and their genetics. And, you know, honestly, there aren't a lot of people who are dedicated enough to do a really good job. And those people that are, the ones that are really dedicated and do a great job and breed great animals, I just have so much admiration for because it's not an easy thing to do. So we need to be able to identify those folks and really be able to benchmark the work that they do um, well, within I, I their think, own realm and in other areas. Yes, yeah, Stacy. I think what I'm trying to say is we're consumers. You know, you're right. It's an industry and we are the consumers. And ultimately, we have to ask the right question and seek out the right results and the right animals, if you will, so that we're not encouraging uh, the kind of slipshod you know, breeding that, that often takes place uh, with people who are strictly in it for the money. So we talk about the the show problem, the problem with show dogs, but we don't talk enough about how those problems are perpetuated by an entire industry of people uh, the puppy mill people who don't concern themselves with the genetic health of the animals just chunking out puppies. <laughs> yep. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and you really need to know who's selling them, especially in this day and age when people are, uh, you know, trading animals on the internet. You don't know where those animals came from. And that's a real problem with dogs. And, uh, you know, I suppose if there became a market for cats, that could become a problem for cats too. Well, there's quite a market for cats on the internet at sure. you know, at, this, at this point, too. So it'll be interesting to see how things evolve over time. Gavin, if folks are interested in finding out more about the work that you are doing, how would they find you? Well, the book has a website, www.comingtothefire.com. And um, it's not active, but I'm going to start posting blogs to it as we get closer to the publication date for the book, which... Uh, I believe we'll be in the fall of 2017, some term around November, just in time for Christmas. That, sound, that sounds great. Um, anything you uh, want to share with our listeners today while you're in the throes of writing this book? Yeah, I guess the main message of the book is think before you breed. Make good decisions. Make a commitment to this. If this is something that you want to do, whether you want to raise horses or you want to breed dogs or or cats, make good conscientious decisions that will have positive impacts throughout the life of the animal. Breed for things like longevity. Will this animal be a you know, healthy animal? Will it be free of genetic defects? And also, you know, I really do encourage people to adopt pets, but I also realize that there are people with specific wants and needs who are going to look for breed animals. So do it conscientiously and know as much as you can before you make that decision. Gavin, I'd like to thank you so much for agreeing to be a guest on my show, and I certainly hope we'll have you on when the book is launched. Oh, I'd love that. Absolutely. The Community Cats podcast is now getting over 3,000 downloads a month. 
The word is spreading and we have a fast growing listener support base. Would your business want to be a sponsor of the show and help us to continue our programs? To find out more details, please go to www.communitycatspodcast.com slash sponsor.